Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be interviewing Bob DeSimone. If you don't know who Bob DeSimone is, well, he's a renaissance man in show business. He has been a drummer for a band. He has been a stand-up comedian who performed at the Comedy Store during the 70s. And I can't wait to hear those stories, as a lot of you know. And he starred in some cult movies. His brother, Tom DeSimone, directed him in movies like Chatterbox, Angel 3, The Final Chapter. And, of course, Danny Steinman casted him in Savage Streets. And, of course, Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. And he is, like, the fifth interview I've done from that movie. So that's going to be pretty fucking cool. And he also was in David Schmoller's The Seduction. And so I cannot wait to have him on the podcast today and talk about those cult movies, talk about the comedy store, talk about drumming. I don't talk with a lot of musicians that much on the show. And I want to hear more about the musician's point of view. I got some really good feedback from my dad about the Willie Hall interview I did a couple months ago. So, yeah, here is my interview with Bob D. Simone. Hey, Bob. Hey, Tommy. How you doing? I'm doing good, sir. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time this evening. Oh, no problem. So, going back to the beginning, uh, did you gravitate towards performing and show business early on? Yeah, you know, um, my family had a lot of musicians in them. Uh, none of them worked professionally that much, maybe little gigs when they were younger and all, but my dad was a very good uh, violinist, uh, played any string instrument, you know, he played mandolin, guitar, violin, Right. And, and just a lot of people in the Desimony family were musically inclined, and I picked up on drums and went from there. Wow. So I, started, uh, I started pretty young, about 12 or 13 years old, playing drums, and then picked up a little guitar with uh, you know, other guys I played with, different band members. I picked up a little guitar along the way, but mostly drums. That's what I play. Nice. What kind of music were you into? Well, you know, when I first started, I was in um, late grammar school and then into uh, junior high. So basically, I was playing the music of the day, that early rock and roll, the uh, 60s rock and roll, then into 70s. But my older brother, Tom, and my sister, they're, they're both older. I'm the youngest one. Mm hmm they used to listen to a guy named Symphony Sid on the radio. He played a lot of the black music, but in those days, it just wasn't on AM radio. So I got turned on to rhythm and blues um, when other kids weren't hearing any of it. They had this radio, and they were picking up the station out of even New York or Chicago. And back then, they used to call it race music. Yeah. You know, and so I was we catching on to a lot of the black players. And then uh, in 66, I came out here to play for Taj Mahal. Do you know who that is? Oh, yes. He's a blues legend. Didn't he do um, She Caught the Katie? He got Taj, yes. So I played for him. I came out here in 66. I left home. I came out here to begin my career in drumming. So uh, I played for Taj, and I played for a ton of black people out here. A lot of the uh, blues artists in the mid sixties were making a big, big splash on the you know on the mainstream scene that time. So I played for Lightning like, Hopkins, I played for Chuck Berry. Wow! So, but he wasn't a blues guy; he was a rocker. But I played for him, and I played. Um, so actually, there's a on Wikipedia. There's a list of the people I played for. And uh, a lot of them were black musicians. I I was in the house band at a club called the Ashgrove back then. That was the biggest place out here for uh, blues and folk music and all that. And um, I backed them all and spent 
so much time with these guys, I'm indebted to them because I learned so much about blues and R&B from these masters. You know, some of these mm -hmm. guys were grandchildren of slaves. Oh, yeah. They were very old at the time. You know, they're all gone now, but I was lucky enough to, uh, besides play for them, have dinner at their homes, I, I would be in the green room with them for, you know, the whole night, except for we were playing, getting high, and just talking about everything going on in the world. So I had a great education for them on and off the stage. Wow, that's amazing. Did, did you ever meet any of the um, British Invasion guys who were influenced by them? Uh, Mick Jagger and um, Eric Burden. Uh, I, I was in a band called Country, and uh, we didn't do country music per se. We did country rock. Mm -hmm. uh, after I, I moved on from the blues thing, I got signed with a group and uh, Atlantic Records, and we put out an album. That business, uh, the business, uh, the guys in the suits are fighting, and two record companies fighting over it. Yeah. Left off in the list. So the band, uh, after that album, they disbanded. But, um, uh, yeah, I. I um, I forgot what your question was. What was it again? <laughs> well, you were, you were telling me, yeah, you met Eric Burden and Mick Jagger. Oh, the, yeah. the when, we, when we had the coming out party for our album, um, whenever they do that, they hire a club, and they happen to hire the Ash Club again. Mm -hmm. And um, I was back there, and it was a coming out party for this new band, Atlantic Records, which was us. So everybody was in the audience. Dr. John the Night Ripper, uh, uh, Eric Burden was there, so all these guys got up and played with us, you know, after we played, you know, eight or nine songs off the album, the place, the whole evening turned into a jam session with all these guys, so it was, uh, it was a kick. I, I met a lot of the guys uh, from England, Rod Stewart, and being on Atlantic Records, uh, whenever any of those guys are in town, we got an automatic backstage to see them because we were on the same label or at least managed by the same people. You know, so mm -hmm. I did get to meet some of them. Yeah. Not the Beatles, wish I did. I met Ringo in a movie theater, but that's it. That's <laughs> wow. Did, did, did you ever have um, an encounter with Ahmed Erdogan? Oh my God, yes. I'm amazed you know. How old are you? I'm 36. I'm almost 36, but I'm an old soul, man. <laughs> okay, you, are you off? off oops, is, uh, Armin Erdogan was a sweetheart of a man. He really was. In fact, the story about us, real quick, Armin Erdogan had a friend on Earl McGrath, <clears throat> and Atlantic was very excited about us, and Earl wanted to start his own little label. Um, but he certainly didn't have the money or anything, so Ahmed gave him his own label called Clean Records, which was part or uh, subsidiary of Atlantic. Mm -hmm. but, and it was a friend of Ahmed, and uh, we spent a lot of time with him. And in fact, he, he uh, produced one of the cuts on our album. Wow. Ahmed Erdogan and Tom Dow produced our second album, but it never got released. But it was Earl McGrath that caused all the problems with the band. Um, he just didn't know what he was doing. Uh, David Geffen and Peter Asher. Peter Asher was our manager from Peter and Gordon. He managed uh, mm -hmm. James Turner and all those guys. Right. He was trying to get us off of the label and offered them. He and David Geffen got together and offered Glenn McGrath uh, every time that we had run up in the studio. You know, when you record an album, they they charge the record company the time, and then that comes out of the royalties before they get paid. Oh. We offered to pay up everything just to get us off the label, and he wouldn't do it. So that's where things really started falling apart. Unfortunately, we, we got left behind. Yeah, people wonder why all these old bands are touring now. It's because you don't make nothing in record sales. <laughs> not today. No, not today you don't. No, no. Yeah. Wow, so you're do so you're doing all this drumming and uh, playing in bands and stuff. So how does that lead to stand up comedy? Uh, the drumming thing after the band uh, disbanded, um, I almost went on the road with Jackson Brown. I was doing a gig in a club, and the bass player 
I think his name is Doug Hayward, who was playing bass in this, uh, just a local band, fighting his time because he was going to go on the road with Jackson Brown. And um, he contacted me and said, come on down and rehearse the studio because I told Jackson about you. So I went down and we all rehearsed. Jackson Brown, David Lindley, myself, Doug Hayward. We started rehearsing golf and stuff. And I was set to go on the tour. And then his regular drummer, who was on the road, um, quit or something happened and he came back and I got pushed back because this was his regular drummer so um, you know he used the regular drummer he was always using instead of me so I started dabbling in comedy I just uh, got interested in I was always a funny guy I guess and I got interested in doing comedy and I joined up with an improv group and we started working and then from there um I first started on my own. You know, I just started yeah. doing comedy at the comedy store and uh, a few of the clubs in town. That's how that thing started. Wow, who's in the improv group with you? Uh, the improv group, nobody really, well, there's one guy, Walter Oakridge. Do you know him, that guy? You, oh, yeah, I've interviewed Walter. Oh, yeah, well, he's a great guy. Wally and I are good friends still. He's going through a lot of crazy stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, we were in a group together, and then the group split, and we went on to do other stuff, and then from there, uh, Wally was about the only um, guy from that group that I think went on to have some success in film and TV. Mm -hmm. Then I went to stand-up comedy, and I started doing a show called Make Me Laugh back in mm -hmm. the, I think it was the late 70s. Yeah. Yeah, I did about 10 of those shows, and then a few parts in movies, and that's how I wound up getting involved in film. And then shortly after that, I started playing drums again, just for fun. I, I still play, you know, I do gigs around town and around California, but just for fun. I mean, we get paid, but it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Compared to what we used to make. <laughs> <laughs> So, as, as a stand-up act, I mean, what year did you get to the comedy store? Let's see. The band thing fell apart around 72. We made our second album in 71, 72, <clears throat> and everything finally ended, and that's when I started getting involved in, I was doing comedy reviews and different improv groups, like I mentioned, there were two or three of them. So, I must have started at the comedy store in the mid mid-70s, probably 75. Mm -hmm. And there were two. There was the original comedy store on Sunset, and then the other one was in Westwood. Right. Um, that was the comedy store. Uh, the, 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 both of them were jumping. I mean, that's when comedy became... Comedy was about as big as pop music. It just exploded in the 70s. Yes. You know, there used to be... If you were a comedian, and this is before I started... Uh, working as a comic, but if you were a comedian, there weren't that many clubs in the country. There were big clubs, you know, a few in New York, a few in Chicago, guys like Dan Leno and stuff like that. They toured the country and they'd work seven or eight, ten different clubs. That was it. And then all of a sudden, Mitzi Shore took over. Um, do you know who she is? Oh, yes. Mitzi Shore, who took over the place. Yeah, her husband and her got divorced. And, um, uh, she took over the place. It was a workshop, and she made it into a, a, a going business, and it just happened to be luck that somehow comedy took off like pop music. Maybe George Carlin had a lot to do with it. I don't know. But, um, I mean, comedy was big. It was as big as any musical group out there. People would be out every night at the different comedy clubs in town. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It really was. Yeah, it was, it was a big revolution, and it was at humble beginnings because, you know, I mean, you had, you know, in, in the er, early, early years, you had vaudeville, you know, and then it became, you know, comics, you know, getting up on stage and yeah. telling jokes. And then you had guys like Carlin and Shelley Berman and Richard Pryor and all these guys who was revolutionizing it. And then by the 70s, there was a whole new wave of guys, you know, trying it, and some of them were good, some of them were bad, some of them were trying to make a career of it, but others were trying to, you know, do it to get into movies or TV yeah. or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
it was just an incredible time. And I've interviewed a lot of the old guys like Tom Dreesen and Jackson Perdue, who was there at that time. Yep. I know all of them. I know all those guys. Yeah. I knew them all. Yeah. It was a fun time. It really was. Mm. Yeah. You, you were there when Robin was there? Yep. I was also, I met Robin in an improv class, a guy named Harvey Lundeck. You yeah. You have cookies for 30 year old kids. You know all this stuff. You probably know who Harvey Lundeck is. I sure do, and I actually know some of his students. Okay. Who do you know? Uh, Carol Ida White. Oh, my God, yes. I know her. She works for my brother. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, God, what's her name? I'm trying to remember. Oh, Lynn Stewart? Uh, I'm not sure. I might know her, but I was in his class as well, and that's where I met Robin. He mm -hmm. was in the same class. Yeah, Lynn ended up becoming one of the um, founding members of the Groundlings later. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. a couple other people. And I know John Ritter was, was in Harvey Limbeck also. Uh, yeah, he was, a good, he was a nice guy. Mm hmm. He was a nice guy. Yeah. And, oh, my God, so, yeah, I mean, there's so many great comics that were there at that time. Did you know Tom Sharp? Tom Sharp, the name is familiar. He was, he was a bald guy. He used to get up on stage dressed like a like an insurance salesman, suit and tie, and he used to play guitar and do these silly songs about being bald. <laughs> Maybe he was after me or before me. I don't remember. Yeah, he, he made a career out of doing commercials. Um, you know, dressed in a, in, a, in a business suit and selling like donuts or or something. It, he disappeared, but he was a pretty funny guy, from what I remember. Bill well, Kirk and Bauer and I were good friends. We still are. Yeah, I, I reached out to Bill, and he's like, "I don't want to do any more podcasts." <laughs> you not doing any more? No. I'll have to talk to him. <laughs> that would be great. I, mean, I used to watch him on just the ten of us back in the day. <laughs> Well, I knew him when we were both starving, knocking around town, and uh, nothing but laughs, constant laughs. In fact, a great story. He he contacted me, and I hadn't seen him in 30 years. And he said, I'm coming out to uh, Santa Barbara. And I don't live far from Santa Barbara, so he said, I'm doing a thing for Alan Dick. This was about three or four years ago. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, my goodness. So he told me where the hotel he was staying at. So I pull up, he comes running out, he jumps in the car, we hug each other, kiss each other on the cheek. I mean, we were like brothers back then. And we went through hell and high water. You know, we performed on the same night, many, many, many nights during the week, you know, weekends and everything. And it was like we have never been apart. And we just drove out to a pier, uh, parked the car, smoked the joint, went into a restaurant, and I said, Bill, it's on me. So the fuck the word steak and lobster. <laughs> <laughs> and they laughed all night. I mean, it was just like, it was perfect. What else would he do? He had a huge appetizer and then steak and lobster. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed all night. I was about, we just told stories of dinner and cracking up. It was a lot of fun. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> were, you, were you there when the strike happened? Oh, yes. In fact, um, when the strike happened, I worked, and um, I didn't take a lot of flack from the other guys. A lot of the other guys were already, I was new there, some of the other guys were already working on TV and everything. So yeah. for me, it was just a place to perform, but I continued to work. Then I started to understand how Mitzi was handling things, and they were right. You know, she was making a fortune. Mm -hmm. And um, all they were asking for, like the headliners, you know, give, give the guys an open 15, 20 bucks. Back then, that was decent because most of the guys were starving. Yeah. So uh, they um, started pushing her, like, you know, give them 15, 20 bucks and give the, the two or three headliners 100 bucks a piece. You know, just, just so they're not working for nothing because... She kept saying, this is a, a workshop. And they were saying, no, it's not a workshop. You're making a fortune here. You know, there's lines outside for every show. It's a two-drink minimum. You know, every, I mean, there was money just pouring into this place. And they said, you've got to give something to the comedians. They're the ones that are bringing the people in. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but that didn't last long. She started paying. She started paying. 
Yeah, Tom and Jackson told me, you know, there were there were guys like Alan Steven who like took her side, you know, like halfway through it and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, they 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 started, you know, treating him and all the other guys that took her side like they were scabs and stuff. Yeah. And some of them didn't talk to those guys for like 20, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Kinison, she wouldn't even let him perform. She said he had no act. He used to take tickets at the door. Yeah. <laughs> I know the Sam stories. I've had some of the uh, the guys who were, who were with Sam during yeah. that era, Don. Yeah, all, all the great cocaine stories at Crest well, Hill. He was a handful. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what about, did you know Dice? Uh, not that well. He came in after I left. After I stopped, he came in after that. I met him a couple of years later, but I didn't know him well at all. Just met him to say hi and all that. I knew guys like Kip and Donna, mm-hmm. uh, Jay Leno, Letterman, all those guys were there at the same time, you know. Yeah. My, my problem was I didn't understand the business end of the business. You know what I mean? I was lucky, uh, <clears throat> not lucky with the drumming, I mean... I got the jobs I got because I, I had the ability, but, you know, that band I landed in, in, like, 1970, they got signed to uh, a record label and all that, but I, I didn't know how to sell myself or how to look for an AJ shop. These guys were sharp enough to understand it was a business. I knew about the show, but I didn't know about the business. Mm-hmm. You know, so... Uh, that that was one thing that held me back. I was always waiting to be discovered, and that just doesn't happen anymore. you got to go in after it. Yeah, I think a lot of those guys didn't understand the business until it was too late. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, I mean, I've, I've been there four times, and when I go in there, I see all the headshots of, like, comedians like the average person never even heard of, but I know uh, who they are because I listen to all the, the Comedy Store podcasts and stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and there's there's stories there involving drugs and mental illness and stuff. It's really, really profound. Yeah, it is. You know. I mean, I saw some guys who were absolutely brilliant, brilliant. Ugh. And you don't hear from them. They were good. Yeah, it's sad. So, I mean, show business, it's also a lot of luck. Mm-hmm. So, it really is. There's a lot of luck involved and people you, you would know that can help you out. And uh, things turned out good for me, so I'm happy. I mean, I often wonder, my wife always says to me, where do you think you'd be today if the band you were in continued on, they kept cutting records, and, you know, we used to open for the Bee Gees, the Linda Ronstadt, we were on our way. We were opening for the bigger bands, and then we were going to be cutting our second album and all that. I said, you know, I mean, honestly, the amount of drugs we were doing back then, I said, I would either be... Very wealthy and very famous, but very dead. You know, I said, who knows what would happen? I mean, this, <laughs> part of the whole era was just being high. Yeah. I mean, you know, we were, it, was a, it was a wild time. I got, it was fun. We all the fun. Oh, yeah, there's, there's one guest I had on. She's now a horror writer, but she was a, um, a, a comedy store waitress uh, between 81 and 82. Her name's Laurie Jacobson. And, uh, yeah, she told me that place was the Studio 54 of Hollywood. I mean, there was oh. there was coke and wild sex happening in the club. And, yeah. and she told me that, and, and I believe her because I kind of had this experience, I, uh, there was ghosts in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you see any? No, I never saw any, but that's what I heard. That's the story. But I've been there a few times. But I, the times I was there, I was so stunned. I, you know, I couldn't even see space. I mean, it was it was on the dance floor. You'd be dancing and somebody would hand you some, you know, uh, anal nitrate, whatever they were. You know, it was it was nuts. It was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's so morally wrong nowadays, but you look back and you're like, I can't complain. It was a fun time. <laughs> yeah, I can't complain, but I tell my kids, keep your nose clean, you know. <laughs> and I do not answer any questions they ask me about my past. Yeah. <laughs> or I beat around the bush, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was curious, what, so what was your act on stage? What was it? Yeah, what was your act? Like, did you just do one-liners? Did you play yeah, instruments? No, I wasn't, you know, I was really along the line as a monologist. 
I basically brought up shit that happened to me during the day and, you know, stuff that, that uh, about my family. Um, <clears throat> I didn't like standing there doing that You know, mm-hmm. I was more uh, like a George Carlin type. I would never say, I would never put myself in his class, not, not for a minute, but I would say that my act is more along those lines, observational stuff, things that happened to me. You know, stuff about my crazy Italian family, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, kind of like what Argus does. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, did did you get into acting because your brother was making movies? You no, know, not really. My brother never really gave me a big part in any of his movies. Um, he always said, "I just have trouble." You know, he said, "You're my brother. You're my little brother. I don't see you as this guy or that guy." And, you know, so that was a little bit of a hindrance. But um, I'm trying to think how I got my first acting job. I'm not even sure what it was I did. I did a some uh, some guy saw me at the comedy store, and he he grabbed me for um, some uh, industrial film. And then Hannah Barbera, they had the L.A. comedy competition. I came in third in, in the city of L.A. And um, I got grabbed to do a show for, uh, to help write and appear in the show for Hannah Barbera. I think that's where it started. And um, <clears throat> we shot a half-hour pilot, but it never went. But we shot the pilot and did all that. Then I kind of got the acting book, you know, and... Um, uh, actually, way back when I was drumming to make extra money, I did what was called sideline work. Mm-hmm. That's where they need a band in the background. Mm-hmm. And I used to get picked for a lot of that because I looked what they call, I looked mod, M-O-D, that was the phrase back then. Right. Um, my hair was a little bit long, but I was clean. I wasn't too, you know, threatening. So we used to get these calls that they were shooting, I did, you know, Mission Impossible, I did a few movie things, but I was always on the stage in a band, nothing big. But sitting around there waiting, uh, the rest of the musicians and I would look at each other and say, how can these people do this? It's so boring. You know, we've been sitting here for eight hours and we're still not even at the scene where we go up there and play for five minutes, you know. (laughs) I never thought I wanted to be an actor, but once I started doing it, getting little calls to do these little parts, it kind of, you know, it was it was interesting, so I thought I'd give it a shot. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I was in a few little movies, and the hell was I in? Uh, uh, you were Chatterbox in the Concrete Jungle. Concrete Jungle, Chatterbox, and then there was uh, um, one that Linda Blair. Oh, Savage Streets. Savage Streets, that's when I met Danny Steinman. Right. And Danny said to me, man, I, I would love to use you in other films I have. I'd like to have actors I can depend on, and I, would love, I said, just call me any time. And it was shortly after that, I opened my own business, and it took off and started doing well. So I left the acting. And uh, my brother called me one day, and he said, have you been talking to Danny Steinman because he's directing a fire film? I said, no, I haven't heard. I said, I quit my agent. And he said, oh, why don't you call him? So I got in touch with Danny. And he said, well, now what you do? I called your agent. I don't know where you are. So there was no, uh, there were no parts left except for two. A guy driving, well, you know, riding in that truck in the beginning and uh, dropping the kid off. And then the other part of Billy pulling up and blowing the cocaine waiting for Lana. He said, that's all I got. I said, oh, whatever. I wasn't even that interested, but I said, I'll take it, I'll do it. He said, you have to find a way to make these two characters one guy. I said, okay. And so he sent me the script, and I read it, and, and I had, like, I don't think there were any lines. It was the very beginning, but I opened the door, and all I said was Tommy. That was it, just Tommy. You know, come on, let's go. That was it. And then when I pulled up for Lana, yeah. The only lines were yelling Lana. That was it. There was nothing else, just Lana. So I called him. I said, I can make these two people one guy. I said, I can just pull up to Lana and let her know, let the people know somehow that I'm that same guy. That's when I wrote the line, uh, just empty my last bedpan. 
<laughs> women like very much to party, right? Mm -hmm. I said I was the pride of the younger race or whatever it was. So that may be the same guy, of course I look like him too. And then uh, Danny said to me, when you're doing the cocaine in the car, do you want to improvise? We'll let you do whatever you want. And I said, yes, I'll improvise. So I improvised. They took the door off the right side, set up the camera, and said, whenever you're ready, just go. So I put the cocaine up under the uh, uh, visor, and I did my whole thing, and that, that was just improvised. <laughs> and, and even in the beginning, when I, when I opened the door for Tommy and he didn't move, uh, that was just, I improvised. I just said, okay, sit there, I don't give a shit. And then when the girl came out to meet him, I was supposed to be a scummy character. I was reading a, a girly magazine in the, in the uh, truck. So I just kept looking her up and down while she was talking. And I'm not even in camera, I'm not even in the scene, but she got nervous by what I was doing and stopped the scene. And Steinman got pissed off. And he said, what's wrong? And she said, he's making me so nervous. And Steinman said, well, use it. Just go with, go with what he's doing. <laughs> so finally, when she turned and walked away, that's when I yanked my ear and did my tongue thing. Just kind of like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> and left it all in. I mean, I had no problem with her. You know, I mean, we got along and all that. But I just... Figured I'd throw that in. So he let me do what I wanted. Now, for me, I had more fun doing those small scenes than if I had a bigger part. I think I, I, I got more out of it from doing that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed, um, you're my fifth interview from the movie, and this is uh, one of my favorite sequels of the series because the killings are so hilarious and demented. Yeah. You know? What, what, what did you think of your death? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I got I got whacked. That was it. They hit a dummy, and I I was done. You know, yeah. um, it ain't much to think about. I mean, you know, you just you just know when you're done with your scene, you're gonna get an axe, and that's the end of it. Um, it was fine by me. I think at the end they were thinking about her finding my body laying there. Which would have been cool for me, but then they decided, no, no, just let her get, you know, get after and leave Billy out. We don't even know where he is, but make it even scarier. So. <laughs> I only do, I worked in the film two days. I showed up for the first scene, and then I showed up at night at uh, the rock store up in Mount Hill Highway for that scene, for the uh, Lana scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about working on Savage Streets? Any memories of that? Um, my brother was the original director of that, but he quit, and that's when Steinman came in. Right. But actually, no, I, I, it was, um, I just kind of hung out and chatted with uh, Linda, because I knew Linda through my brother, another film she did for him, and a few other people, but I only worked on that one day, again, with one of those short scenes, you know. Mm-hmm. No, I, I really can't give you any special information on that either <laughs> because I just came in, worked, and left. It was getting real close to me uh, leaving show business and moving on to something else, you know? Mm -hmm. so I show up work and split. Some people would hang around and try to get close to producers, and I, I mean, that stuff never, I was never interested in that. Mm hmm. You also, you also had a, a tiny part in David Schmuller's The Seduction. Yeah, yeah. That was another small part. I don't even know how I got that, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, that was with Morgan Fairchild. Right, and Vince Edwards. Yeah, yeah. And she was a sweetheart. She really was. I always thought she was a plastic kind of a thing, you know, a blonde bombshell, but <laughs> she was very sweet. She was a good kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that, again, that was a very small part, and that was, I was doing a play at the time, so I was driven to the set, I did my part, they drove me back to the, where I was doing my play in Glendale, so those were uh, just, just quick scenes in and out, and I did uh, 10 shows and make me laugh, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun, mm -hmm. a lot of fun. So you, so you did theater too? Oh yeah, I did live theater. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. What, kind, what kind of parts did you play? Well, live theater, um, we did a show. We did Harvey, believe it or not. I right? did Harvey in high school. I love that There's play. A, a Glendale Center theater out here. It's a huge theater in the round. And um, there's a production of Harvey and uh, directed that in touch with me and called me down to play uh, Dr. Chumley. So uh, he gave, I can't see again these people, they gave me free way. They, they knew my ability to improvise, I guess. So he, naturally I stuck to the lines, but I added all kinds of shtick to it. It made it a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah, a um, couple of months before my car accident, I volunteered uh, for a theater company in Palo Alto, and um, it was a production of Harvey. I, I was I was just volunteering to work the concession stand, but I was watching it, and I was so blown away by how they did it. I wish I had auditioned for it. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a great movie, too. Yes, it is. So you're an actor, too. Yep. Ah, good for you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still pursuing it? Oh yeah, I was in t- I was in L.A. a couple weeks ago uh, to meet up with this uh, director friend of mine, and um, he offered me a part in a movie um, about the mob. You know, it's funny. You know how how Hollywood sees you a certain way that you don't see yourself. I don't <laughs> see myself as as a mafia guy, but hey, if they, if they want if they want me for that, I'll try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, it was very flattering. Yeah. So, Who knows if they're ever right, you know. Yeah. Um, I have a friend, the actor Chris Cooper. That name sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, you know Chris Cooper, trust me. <laughs> All right, when, when, when you're done talking to me, just type in Chris Cooper and Google him. He's, uh, he's been uh, Lonesome Dove's adaptation. Did you see the movie Breach? No. No, did you see Adaptation? He won the Academy Award for that. Oh, I'm looking him up now. Yeah, I, I know who he is. Yeah, he's a. Yeah. This guy plays cowboys. Well, did you did you see Sea Biscuit? I love Sea Biscuit. Yeah. You did see that? Yeah. Yeah, he played the horse player. Jeff Bridges is great in that movie. Jeff Bridges and Chris Chris played the horse trainer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, he gets all these parts as cops and cowboys, but he's hysterically funny. Um, he has a tremendous sense of timing and all that. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, being interviewed, he, he just sits there and freezes. You know, as long as he's in character, he's brilliant. But he's been invited on a million talk shows he never goes. And he said to me, what the hell am I going to talk about? I, I'm not interesting. I go, you are, but just do it. But he keeps getting, as you mentioned, how Hollywood sees you. He keeps getting seen as a cowboy or a detective or one of those characters. And uh, when he did adaptation, it was very, he played a, a real guy, uh, John LaRoche, who was a, LaRoche himself was on the spectrum somewhere. Uh, extremely brilliant, but a little strange. And he played him so well, and he played him with a comedic edge. He won an Oscar. He's got great comedic timing, but they keep hiring him for these, you know, cowboy and detective things. That's how he gets stuck in that business. Yeah, and you know what? That's not a bad thing to be seen as a cowboy or detective, because look yeah, at... not really, but he's getting tired of it, you know. Yeah, but look at all the old-time actors from the golden age of Hollywood. They were seen that way, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? You know it's funny, James Cagney, who I love. Yeah. He started out as a song and dance band. Right. And he wound up making those B tough guy movies because he was the quintessential tough guy. Yeah. But then he made Yankee Doodle Dandy where he sang and danced, and he won an Oscar for it. Talk about a, a charmed life. Mm-hmm. You know, he went right back and made a movie that was so out of the norm that he usually did, and he won an Oscar. Yeah, he was a brilliant actor. Yeah, he was a fun guy. He was really, I enjoy watching his films. Mm-hmm. Did, you, did you ever get to meet him? Uh, okay, this is a story. <laughs> I met his feet. Um, when I first moved to California, I worked at a, <clears throat> a place called Green Black Deli. Mm-hmm. And... I used to work from noon till two in the morning, three days a week. It took me the 
met to say, I was just a kid. I was in my early 20s. And still took me, when you start working at noon, and you're driving a delivery truck all the day, delivering liquor to all the movie stars, you know, tons of cases of booze and whatnot. And then at night, you're delivering up in the Hollywood Hills to a bunch of hippies and orgies and whatever. Another fun gig. That was a great gig. <laughs> but I was delivering cases of liquor to Jay Cagney's house up on the uh, Coldwater Canyon. And I said to the guy, he said, he said it's James Cagney. I said, okay. All of these fancy houses I would go to, they had delivery entrances in the back, service entrance. So I went in the back of this big uh, New England type home. Mm -hmm. The sweet little Irish maid came up and let me in and I was taken. It was Christmas time. So all of the stars were buying cases of booze because they'd give it out as gifts. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, taking the booze down into a den and there were pictures all over the wall, all over the wall of, of Cagney, but not in the movies. At his place in Nantucket, on his boat, all of that. And I was coming up and down the stairs. She was a sweetheart, and she wrote a big tip on the slip for me. And I happened to hear a dog bark. And I looked down the hallway, and there was these pocket doors slid open. And I saw a dog lying next to a hassock and a pair of feet on the hassock. <laughs> and the dog barked again, and his hand came down and tapped the dog in the head, and I heard, all right, all right, calm down. It was Cagney. It was... <laughs> <laughs> but all I saw was feet. And I looked at the maid, and I said, is that Mr. Cagney? And she said, yes, it is. He's talking to his agent. And, uh, I just should have said, let me just go say, oh, you know what I mean? But I didn't. All I saw was his feet. So oh. that's all I meant. Wow. And Hollywood in, in those days, I mean, it was just so much more intimate. Yeah, yeah. You know? He was already an old guy. You know, his his movie days were just about ending, and he was just kicking back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. But I met a lot of stars back, back in those days before I even got going to the music thing. I was one of my first job, so I delivered to tons of uh, celebrities. Yeah. Wow. Some are nice and some are jerks. You know, you get that kind of a of course. sense of Hollywood, too. It kind of jades you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I've been finding that out since I started this podcast this is with, yeah. certain, with certain people. You know, it's it's pretty heartbreaking. But, you know what? I'm very blessed with the people I do get on here. Oh, thanks. You're too kind. Oh, my pleasure, sir. So what are you doing these days? These days I'm getting ready to retire. And um, we bought a place in Cape Cod, because I'm originally from Massachusetts, and my wife fell in love with Cape Cod a few trips we made back there. So we bought a place there overlooking the bay, and we just bought a condo uh, in Palm Springs near my brother. So once I retire, um, we'll be living on Cape Cod for the summers and then back here in Palm Springs for the winters, because I don't want to be in the snow. And I did that for 20 years of my life, and I'm not going to do that anymore. So we live between the two coasts. A summer's back there, and winter's here. So right now, I'm just, I'm just getting ready to sell my business, and I'm already working with some financial people and, you know, structuring the retirement and all of that. That'll be it. My two kids are in college. You know, I got married late. I didn't get married until I was 48. My wife is about 15 years younger than me, so our first child was born when I was 50. Nice. Yep. So they're both in college, and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be uh, going out there all soon. But me being Italian, I want them around all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to see them leave two girls, but they will, you know, but we'll always be close, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my mom, she's retiring in a month. She's been working for the cable company for 30 years, which is how I know so many movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, retirement, that's grand. You know, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Are you... I, it, when I retire, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be golfing, but I'm also going to be playing uh, drums. i got a lot of musicians from back east that are just waiting, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want me to get back there and we put a band together, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave up a lot of my time playing. There's enough clubs back there as well. 
nice, nice. You get to play for fun. Yeah, yeah. Just we didn't see a Monday, Saturday. I was over to see a friend in his band, and I wound up sitting in and playing. Yeah, a lot of fun. And my band is almost ready. It's almost ready to go. We've, we've got about maybe eight more songs to get down and have enough for the whole evening of this set going out to the clubs and playing. But you'll see that on Facebook, too. Mm-hmm. I'll advertise that. Cool. Are you glad you at least had the ride that you had in Hollywood? Yeah. Yeah, I am. And if I could, if I could made the right moves at the right time, I may have gone on to be a lot more successful. But then again, uh, I'm happy now. I've done well, so I'm not, you know, I'm not hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as retirement and all that, and things are good. Um, I just wonder what kind of life I would have had. Would it have been, you know, real Hollywood, schlocky, bullshit life? Or with the music, would it have been nothing but more and more drugs? The more the more popular the band got back then, uh, we were popular in L.A., then we were big in California, then we started opening for bigger people. And as that happened, the drugs just became more and more plentiful and more and more out of control. So... You know, for me, the question, like my wife asked me, where do you think you'd be today if that stayed together? And who, who knows? But the ride I had was fun. Mm-hmm. It was informative, I'll tell you that. I can, yeah, I can sure tell that, that it is. <laughs> you can learn a lot. You know, you can learn a lot about all the fun, and you can learn a lot about some really sleazy people in this business. Really. Uh, mm-hmm. Just a lot of them. A lot of them. Do you, do you ever get invited to uh, horror cons for Friday? Oh my God, I have a time. I, I've only gone to one. Um, as a matter of fact, I had no idea that, that all these years, it's just been in the past maybe five or six years that I've been all of a sudden signing autographs, people from all over the world sending me stuff to sign. Somebody contacted me out of the blue and wanted me know if they could interview me and I didn't have any idea what they wanted to interview me about. I wasn't sure if it was the music thing, the comedy thing, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. And they, they mentioned the Friday film and I said, really? And so they brought me up to speed on what was going on and, and um, then Facebook came along mm-hmm. and people just started connecting with me on Facebook, and then because of Facebook, uh, a couple of interviews I did uh, that were printed, people had, um, they would get in touch with the interviewer, and I said, sure, send them my email, that's safe enough, you know, and I started getting all of these requests for uh, autographs, but it, it's been a kick, it's really been an amazing kick, because this was going on for so long, and I had no idea that these movies became cult classics. I have no, no, no idea what they were. And in the past five or six years, I've been all these people that uh, they're friends on Facebook, I've done interviews, um, sending out autographs, and uh, it's been a kick. It's fun. Yeah, the last three years I've been going to horror cons, I've been finding out that so many movies I grew up watching are have become classics just as much as... Um, you know, Dracula 1931 was with Bela Lugosi. And I was just like, oh my God, really? I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. And even the people that were in these 80s horror movies can't even believe that too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it just blew my mind. I mean, I've got people in Australia sending me stuff to, to sign and send back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's pretty strange, but, you know... Uh, if, if I kid with Cooper, I kid with Chris Cooper a lot because he gets hit for autographs constantly, you know, 10 times the amount I would ever dream of, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll get somebody, you know, two or four, and I go, look at this pal, look at that, three people, look at how cool that is. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, he kept his head on straight. He lives in a nice little house in Kingston, Massachusetts, and it's not far from the place we bought in Cape Cod. He and his wife, Mary Ann, who I've known, we were an item way back, Marianne and I, mm-hmm. and lost touch with each other when I moved to California. When we reconnected, I found out she was married to Chris. That's how I met him. So 
because every time we're back there, we're always hanging out. And uh, he has kept his head on straight. He doesn't like the Hollywood scene. He lives in a nice little house in Kingston, you know? Right. Uh, I mean, the most unpretentious little place, very warm, very nice, just the two of them. And uh, they get along quite well. Yeah, he mm -hmm. only comes to Hollywood when he has to. Yeah. Uh, like Robert De Niro does. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I. I I no I haven't met anybody from um, part five in person. I've only interviewed them, and uh, I, I want to correct myself. I've interviewed six people from part five, not five. Wow. But um, yeah, I hope I mean I hope they um, invite invite you to uh, another another con. That would be great. Oh, if there's one, if there's one locally, uh, <clears throat> I met. There was one in Burbank that I went to. It was kind of fun. It was fun. Oh, was that a son of Monster Palooza? I've heard the name. Yeah, he's set up the thing for a couple of people from Friday, and uh, it was okay, you know. I mean, um, I just had trouble taking money for an autograph. I mean, when people, yeah. when people ask me for an autograph, I send it. I don't charge. They, they want to know how much. And I go, it's, you know, if you're nice enough to ask for my autograph, that, you know, that's fine. I'll be happy to send it with no charge, really. I, I, I can't see that. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed people who have that same stance, and then I've interviewed people who who who, who kind of don't. But they said if you can, you know, come up with a better way for me to make m money, you know, <laughs> tell me, and I won't charge anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, I heard there was some old-time actors like um, um, don't quote me because uh, it may not have been Gary Cooper, but not Gary Cooper. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, some famous actor, Cary Grant, maybe. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me. But one of them, if you wanted an autograph, you had to pay him. Oh. And I thought, Jesus, for the money you're making, Tal, you know, just give him an autograph. Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. Yeah, quote unquote commodities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Bob, this has been great. I, I thank you so much for coming on tonight. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure, kid. Yes, I hope uh, your retirement goes well, and I hope, like I said, you get invited to a con so we can meet in person. Or, hell, when I when I move down to Los Angeles later this year, hey, heck, I might even see you around if you're around. Well, I'm in Camarillo, so we're not too far apart. Let me know, and uh, if, if I'm gigging one night, come on out and see the band. Oh, that would be great. Okay. All right. Well, All right, thanks so much. I appreciate it. You're a good interviewer. Uh, I try. Thank you, sir. Okay, kid. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Bob DeSimone. Ain't he a cool dude? Yes, he is. Thank you so much, sir. You're a renaissance man of show business with great stories. Very humble and nice. I really enjoyed talking to you, sir, and I thank you for complimenting my interview skills. I'm trying each episode to get better. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, add me as a friend on Facebook, join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook, follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes! <laughs>